some live such simple, uh, unspectacular lives. They don't have a world mission. A Jesus and a Paramahansa Yogananda and a Krishna and Buddha, they had world missions. But some are very obscure and some won't manifest any uh, powers. It's just not needed. Uh, just their devotion is the uh, example, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, powers are no indication of realization necessarily. And quite frankly, what happens if, if we get them early, the ego gets involved. Pride, be, pride swells up and that's led to the fall of many a great yogi, many a great saint. Conscious Conversations with Nick and Nitin. Hey everyone, welcome to Conscious Conversations. I'm your host, Nitin Garg, and I'm joined today by Nick Paladino King, my co-host, as well as uh, Brother Ritananda. Brother, welcome to Conscious Conversations. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'll just do a brief intro, but really, uh, you know, I, I won't be doing any justice to, you know, an amazing... Um, the amazing person that you are and, and how much there is, uh, you know, to your background. So I'm, we're looking forward to learn more about you. But for the listeners, um, Brother Ritananda, uh, whose name actually means bliss through the awareness of harmony, has been a monk of the Self-Realization Fellowship for over 40 years. And he currently serves as a minister in charge uh, for the SRF Bay Area Temple in Walnut Creek. Um, and Brother um, you're a monas monastic. Uh, you're also the minister in charge for the Beria Temple. Uh, we want to welcome you to this is a this is the first time we're actually hosting a conversation with anyone from the Self Realization Fellowship uh, mm -hmm. spiritual path, and you know, re really a uh, the path that began over a hundred more than a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's uh, uh, we're talking today uh, a lot around the 100th year celebration of Paramahansa Yogananda's work in the Bay Area specifically. But actually his work began, you know, over 100 years ago in the States. Um, I want to start off with just uh, handing the mic over to you and actually uh, letting you, uh, I know you're going to kick us off with a grounding uh, exercise, some sort of a meditation. And then we'd love to go into, you know, more of an introduction and um, and really hearing from you uh, about your path and what's led you to where you are today. Okay, sounds good. Well, let's begin. We'll begin with an affirmation. Uh, and uh, so it's good to, an affirmation is a technique you can use as a meditation technique. And um, it's good to go into any meditation uh, by practicing some breathing exercises first. So we'll do that. And if you're new to meditation, uh, there's, it's very simple. There's two fundamentals, and one is to maintain an erect spine for the duration of the meditation without tension or stress. And so at home, now some of people, some of your listeners may be at work and just having this in the background, but if you're at home, uh, at a park, wherever you are, you can sit in lotus posture, cross-legged, on a chair, it makes no difference because in any one of those uh, positions, you can maintain that erect spine for the duration of the meditation without tension or stress. So that's the first thing is that erect spine. And then it's a, you close your eyes and a gentle lifting of the gaze to the level of the point between the eyebrows. Uh, you often hear, you know, uh, look to the point between the eyebrows, but it is just a gentle lifting of the physical eyes. The physical eyes are gently lifted. The mental concentration perhaps is at one point but the, we don't have to, you just lift the gaze and hold it there for the duration of the meditation. That corresponds to the spiritual perception, the point of spiritual perception. And if your eyes drop, of course, eyes straight ahead correspond to um, activity, material consciousness. Uh, eyes down correspond to subconsciousness, sleep. And so you want to maintain that gently lifted gaze throughout the meditation. So let's just sit in meditation posture, get comfortable, get that spine erect, ideally away from the back of the chair if you're sitting in a chair. And we'll begin, lift, now gently lift the gaze. And we'll begin with some breathing exercises. So the first one is just inhale naturally, slowly. And as you're inhaling, slowly tense the entire body from low tension to medium tension to high tension, but never to the point of discomfort. And then we're going to exhale with a double exhalation, one short and one long breath through the mouth. So it 
We'll inhale in tense and then a double exhalation and relax. We'll exhale, relax and feel. So let's inhale in tense. Exhale and relax. Inhale in tense. Exhale and relax. One more time. Inhale and tense. Exhale, relax and feel. And now let us practice an affirmation together. And so <clears throat> we'll just repeat it three times in a normal voice and then three times in a soft voice and then a couple times mentally and then we'll finish with an om peace amen so please repeat after me i will relax and cast aside i will relax and cast aside all mental burdens all mental burdens allowing god to express through me allowing god to express through me his perfect love, peace, and wisdom. His perfect love, peace, and wisdom. I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens, allowing God to express through me His perfect love, peace, and wisdom. I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens, allowing God to express through me his perfect love, peace, and wisdom. I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens. Allowing God to express through me his perfect love, peace, and wisdom. I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens, allowing God to express through me His perfect love, peace, and wisdom. I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens, allowing God to express through me His perfect love, peace, and wisdom. Now go on repeating it silently, mentally, as often as the mind wanders, and it will just bring it back calmly. That affirmation, I will relax and cast aside all mental burdens, allowing God to express through me his perfect love, peace, and wisdom.
peace. Amen. Thank you, brother, for guiding us through that uh, meditation and affirmation. I certainly feel incredibly think, uh, grounded. <laughs> yeah, just uh, that was less than five minutes and you can feel the peace. And um, that's what meditation can do for our lives. Yeah. I really like the piece around um, relaxing the mental burdens. That feels very important, you know, very and um, very relevant to to what I would say almost all of us are are working through as being human. And that's just a really nice reminder to slow down and receive. It's kind of what I was feeling there. And um, really, yeah, I can even hear my voice being very different than when we started. So thank you for that. Yeah. It's always so cool when we get to do all these conversations that we get to meet with so many different adepts and masters and all every time we get to learn a new new technique it's such a treat it really is yeah um it's it's one of the reasons why we start off each mm -hmm. episode you know with some sort of a grounding because the conversation we're often about to have yeah requires us to connect with this sense of peace and groundedness um yes so thank you for that brother that was beautiful and i would love for the audience to get to know you a little bit more than you know, just just the very brief introduction that I did. So can, can you tell us a little bit about your life and, you know, how you uh, became a monk, how you became a monastic um, and you're on the you've been on the path of self-realization fellowship for over 40 years. Uh, where, where was life prior to SRF for you and um, how did that transpire over the years? What were some key moments for you? Yeah, my uh, path, I was always in the shadows of Self-Realization Fellowship. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in another faith, but I grew up in uh, Los Angeles and in North San Diego County. And so in Los Angeles, I lived in uh, South Pasadena, and that's literally about seven minutes away from the international headquarters of Self-Realization Fellowship on the top of Mount Washington. But I never knew about it. It's uh, if you've ever been to Mount Washington, it's these uh, windy, narrow streets. You don't stumble across the international headquarters. <laughs> so I didn't know about that. But um, when I was five years old, we started uh, vacationing in Encinitas, California. Mm -hmm. And um, back then in 62, there was no freeway from L.A. to San Diego, only a highway in the Encinitas self realization Fellowship Encinitas Ashrams right on the highway with beautiful golden lotus towers. And so you couldn't help but notice that. But uh, so I was aware of it. And um, but it wasn't till um, I was about a year out of high school. I had two friends who graduated a year before me. They moved to Encinitas from South Pasadena. We started taking uh, yoga, half a yoga lessons. And they're path yoga teacher gave them a copy of autobiography of a yogi so they told me you got to buy this book you got to buy this book and uh i eventually did right but there, i held anyone, it anyone watching <laughs> <laughs> most yeah. people are familiar with it yeah and um so i held it and it wasn't until i was on a plane to go live in new zealand study a year in university in new zealand that i read it on the plane autobiography of a yogi and for me, everybody has a different story, but for me, it was instantaneous. This is what I want. This is my path. <laughs> and so that when I landed for the first time, I had grown up in the shadows of the Self-Realization Fellowship ashrams, and now I'm interested. And for the first time in my life, I'm 7,500 miles away. <laughs> so it wasn't meant to be earlier. It happened as just as it was supposed to happen. And... Um, but then I, uh, I got back after about a year and a half in New Zealand and then traveling and then uh, applied for the lessons. And that's how the Self-Realization Fellowship Meditation Techniques are disseminated and the How to Live Teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, which are they're so beautiful. They're so wonderful because there's no aspect of our life we need to separate from our search for God. And we use, we use the term God a lot. And for some people, that's it turns them off. And I apologize to them 
uh, you know, substitute universal spirit, universal consciousness, divine, whatever works for you. Um, the Paramahansa Yogananda said, I mean, that's one reason he came. He was sent to the West. His we're 400 years into the Dwapara Yuga. We're 400 years out of, away from the Kali Yuga, the Dark Ages. And um, in the Dark Ages, fear uh, and guilt are, are major tools in, in religious um, philosophy, but it has no place in, in, a, in an awakening age. And so Paramahansa Yogananda was sent to disseminate the scientific path of uh, Kriya Yoga meditation, where you can, through daily application, transcend uh, restless thoughts and all human limitations and so forth to a transcendental state and experience a direct uh, personal experience of universal consciousness, spirit, God, whatever you want to call it. And um, so I applied for the lessons in college. And then um, a few months into that, I got a little notification with the lesson saying, uh, introducing the monastic order. And I thought, well, yeah, again, it was almost instantaneous for me. This is what I want. But I wanted to prove it was a real, it was real and not a whim. And so I got a job in my field. I graduated in uh, December 1978. And got a, I was in horticulture. I used to grow avocados. <laughs> so I got a job in Santa Barbara, California, growing avocados. And if you've ever been to Santa Barbara, uh, I've been around the world um, teaching, uh, Self-Realization Fellowship teachings. And Santa Barbara has got to be in the discussion of some of the most beautiful places on the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was working in paradise um, and growing avocados. But 10 months into it, my heart was still in the ashram it wanted to it wanted that so i pursued that and within a year and a half i was in the monastic order and now i'm going on my 45th year uh, in the monastic order <laughs> wow what a journey and and also how clear it was for you like you know uh, it, it seems like it really came through very clearly right and it was all it the from the moment it arrived it was ever present in your journey yeah, that's right. And everybody's story is different. So we should never compare ourselves to others as far as what we're experiencing in meditation or not experiencing. And you can't you compare the, uh, the fact that it was so instantaneous. It doesn't necessarily uh, make it better or worse. And that's important because there, there's a funny story. There were two monks. Uh, they were engineers in the aerospace industry in the 1950s. They were best friends. One of them found autobiography of a yogi. And so he shared it with, you get this initial enthusiasm. Uh, you've read it, Nick, and it's, you mm -hmm. read it, Nick, this is fantastic. You got to share it with friends. So he shared it with his best friend and that the best friend didn't even get all the way through the book and returned it to him and said, this is the best uh, science fiction book I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> but six months later, that friend asked that other uh, fellow who they both became SRF monks. He asked him for that book. He says, because anything that can make you change as dramatically as you've changed in the last six months, I got to know more about. And they both ended up being monks for over 60 years. <laughs> so wow. this was quite different, but uh, but mine was instantaneous. And yeah. uh, that is a, an indication of uh, the proof of reincarnation. Uh, I had uh, been involved before. And, and for anyone that's listening to not uh, despair to what, what Brother Ritananda just shared, uh, my own story it took me over five years from reading the book. And I was sort of actively in search for a spiritual path to when I actually committed and, you know, really went through the lessons and, and uh, got initiated in Kriya Yoga. It was a multi, multi-year journey. And, and the commitment is still every day, every day you got to show up with that commitment, right? So there's, a, um, there's an ongoing practice as well. Yeah, we have to renew our, our desire for, for God every day. <laughs> but uh, it is it is funny because uh, we'll give a Sunday service and afterward we'll be greeting the congregation as they're exiting. And very often we'll, people will say, oh, yeah, I read autobiography in college. These are like 60 year olds. And I read autobiography of a yogi in college. And then and they're looking for words and I'll say life got in the way. They go, yeah, 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 life got in the way. <laughs> but, you know, 40 years have passed, but they're back. 
And uh, so it, it is, I love to hear the stories of how people got on the path because they're, so they're, they're really fun. Yeah. Very cool. Would you mind giving a, a quick brief um, kind of synopsis of who Parhamsa Yogananda was and what the Tetans are about? I'm, I'm sure there's people listening that aren't quite uh, up to date with this. If we, maybe like a, just a couple, two, three minutes kind of overview of actually who this person was and the impact he had on, on our lives, maybe without us even, even knowing it. Yeah, he, he was born in 1893 in India. And then um, and he in 1920, he was invited to the International Congress of Religious Liberals, and they were convening in Boston that year. And so his guru, guru told him that, you know, yes, you should, you should go. And he didn't really even speak English. He, he spoke some, but of course, there was no plane travel back then, 1920. And so he traveled on a boat, the city of Sparta, it was called. And uh, he was asked by other passengers to give a talk on the boat. And he got up there and he really, he didn't speak good enough English and he froze. And for those of you, you guys have both probably done some public speaking. When you freeze in front of an audience, you know, what's 10 seconds, what is literally 10 seconds to you, it seems like four or five minutes. And, but he, he literally froze for almost 10 minutes. He just stood there. <laughs> but then um, he heard it, the words of his guru, Swami Sri Rikteswar, you know, speak. And and then he gave a, a talk. And um, so he spoke at that uh, Congress of Religious Liberals in Boston. And his very first talk, um, it, we have a book, um, The Science of Religion. And that's basically a transcript of that first talk. And autobiography of a yogi is often, is the most common mm, means that somebody finds the path of self-realization, finds the teachings of self-realization and gets interested, whether they're a friend and just like to a, attend a, a temple service from time to time, or they're a student and um, reads the books and maybe applies for the lessons, but doesn't take Kriya Yoga, or if they're a member and they take Kriya Yoga. Um, but it's, so yeah, he spoke and, um, he spent the first four years in Boston. It's fascinating because uh, an avatar, a prophet like a Jesus, a Buddha, a Krishna, a Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, if they're going to be an example to us, they're not given a roadmap that, that, okay, you do this and then you do this and then you do this. And so he was spent the time in Boston. He didn't know a soul. He just had, a, he already had any money. He stayed in uh, the YMCA when he first got there and um, figuring out how he was going to disseminate this ancient science of Kriya Yoga meditation. And then it was, we are celebrating in the Bay Area, the 100th anniversary of Paramahansa Yogananda's first talk in San Francisco Bay Area. And it's so in 1924, after four years in Boston, you know, meeting friends and starting the work there, starting small groups there and getting some financial backing, he made a cross country trip and ended up in San Francisco. And that was his first talk. And then <clears throat> it was in 1925, he found uh, what is now our international headquarters on top of Mount Washington in Los Angeles. And um, then he would just go on speaking tours and the work started growing from there. And some lessons first started in the 1930s. In 1946, he published Autobiography of a Yogi. And again, many people have read it. They read it in college and, uh, you know, 40 years have passed. But it is a, it is still on some bestseller lists. And um, it's, it's still maintained its relevance through, and it was released in 1946. And, but um, it was just about five years ago, uh, we came out with the, uh, latest and last edition of the Self-Realization Fellowship Lessons. And it was a lifetime work of um, our late president, Sri Merlin Mata, because even as a 14 year old, Paramahansa Ji saw, you know, why she incarnated in, in her strengths. And he gave her about that at that age, the responsibility of editing those lessons and incorporating uh, many new talks that he had, he, he gave through the decades. And then, 
um, he spent the last four years of his life in the desert uh, working on these teachings and he would work just 18 hours or more. He didn't need to sleep much or at all. And so she was tasked with incorporating all that new material into the lessons. Mm -hmm. And that was only completed about five years ago and they were released. And uh, they are, even if this isn't your path, um, the meditation techniques you learn through those, because we're non-denominational. And so uh, those teachings help us to teach us to spiritualize every aspect of our life. And every aspect of our life will benefit from them and the meditation techniques. You, you know, you will learn energization exercises, the Hong Sa technique of concentration, the Om technique of meditation. And even if you go no further, again, literally every aspect of your life will be helped, will be improved uh, through those teachings and those techniques. And again, it, it can make a Christian a better Christian and a Muslim a better Muslim and, and so forth. And then one thing you learn in the beginning, especially with meditation, you're learning to truly concentrate. We learn to memorize, at least in school in the West, but we don't necessarily learn to concentrate. And you learn to concentrate. You learn to consciously, deliberately calm yourself down. And we're always more efficient when we're calm. So being more calm and concentrated, we're a better student. We're a better boss. We're a better parent. We're a better teacher. Uh, we're a better um, partner instead of reacting emotionally when maybe our partner says something that pushes a button we act from the soul calmly objectively and it prevents a lot of drama in our life so little, literally every aspect of our life is is benefited from the teachings and uh, that's how paramahansa ji um because he knew it had to stand up through the ages um decided on this is how the techniques will be disseminated is through the spoken word, but more through that written word, through those lessons, because they stand uh, the test of time. In ancient India, of course, the techniques were, the teachings were handed down verbally from guru, disciple, and so forth. But in this new age, that won't reach enough people. And so uh, Paramahansa Yogananda established the Self-Realization Fellowship Lessons. Yeah, there's a there's a um, there's some very interesting background, you know, to um, a lot of the the conversation that we're having and the and the depth that you're explaining. You mentioned, you know, the ages that we're in, and you mentioned that earlier, uh, briefly as well, like this end of Kali Yuga where there was dogma and a lot of teachings driven through fear, and how this era is meant to be a dissemination of teachings. And I remember. Early on, as um, as I was doing some of my own research and reading, that uh, Paramahansa Yogananda put a lot of emphasis on the science of religion. In fact, I believe that was one of his first lectures uh, when he arrived in the states, and he was trying to shed light on how there is a uh, a more sort of step by step method to attaining God realization. That there is a scientific way of going about this. Can you speak a little bit to that, like? You know, um, I, I felt that was a real key differentiation. That's something that people still struggle with. You know, for most of us, science and religion are are completely two different things. And yes, and he was really trying to speak to connecting those. Yes, well, yoga <clears throat> is the science of religion, and it was developed millenniums ago by the ancient rishis. And for when people in the West here, yoga for, for the vast majority, it begins and ends with half a yoga. Mm -hmm. But yoga is this vast, comprehensive science. Uh, we've all heard of karma yoga, selfless service. And there's bhakti yoga, the path of devotion. There's jnana yoga, the path of wisdom. And so uh, it is in the, uh, and it, it is meant to uh, supplement our religion, our spiritual efforts. And um, so Paramahansa Yogananda brought this distillation, Raja Yoga, the royal yoga. And because it, Hatha Yoga is incredibly beneficial and devotion is always going to be a vital part of anybody's spiritual path and uh, faith and so forth. But in the Kali Yuga, the dark age, 
mankind's consciousness was so unrefined, if you will, that uh, faith and dogma and fear was all it could handle. But we are in this awakening, uh, Dwapara Yuga, where that no longer satisfies the soul. Because that's a key point of Paramahansa Yogananda's teachings, not just his teachings, but um, that we are, we have a body, we have a mind, but we are the soul. We're spiritual beings in a material world. Why? Well, that's a whole nother <laughs> podcast, but we are. We're the soul. And the soul and being made in the image of God, as all true scriptures state, and God isn't flesh and bones. In the autobiography, it's not some graybeard sitting on an antiseptic corner of the cosmos in some throne. God is infinite, eternal, ever blissful, loving consciousness, however you want to define it. And we're made in that image. And so nothing physical can ever satisfy the soul. Is that God so, calling? Is it- <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I should not go. I should not go on. <laughs> Hold on. We're busy. <laughs> so, so uh, um, yeah, that you, you just mentioned that science of religion, his first talk in the United States, because it, it is so compelling because one thing he does in it is he says, we're all seeking the same thing. And on the surface, you go, well, no way, that's that's crazy, because there's those people uh, who devoted to some religion, spiritual seekers, and then there's atheists. We're not seeking the same thing. But he points out in a very step by step manner, like it's he, it's a it's a he's like he's a lawyer in the courtroom. But he says what well, we're, we're all seeking, we can agree, elimination of pain and suffering. And I think everybody goes, OK, yeah, I could buy into that. Um, we're all, I'd love to eliminate suffering and pain in my life. But he, that yields a state of peace. And as, as enjoyable as that is, and as powerful as that is, ultimately, that's not enough. We want something uh, positive. And what we want is um, we want happiness. But we've all had happiness in the world. We've had pleasures. There, there's pleasure, then there's happiness. And we've had happiness. It could have been when a child was born, it could have been the perfect moment of a vacation, a, an achievement, establishing a business, climbing a mountaintop, whatever it is. We've had it, but it's fleeting. Mm-hmm. It's because everything in this world has a limited shelf life. Uh, it's interspersed with sorrow or reversals of fortune, um, health issues, because that's the nature of this world. That's not the happiness we're seeking. We want a happiness that is always with us. So. It's an eternal happiness if it's always going to be with us. We want to be conscious of it at all times, even when we're sleeping. We don't want nightmares. And, you know, we want to be conscious of it, even if we're engaged in most strenuous activities or dealing with uh, difficulties and tests and trials in life. We want that undercurrent of happiness. So it, as we said, it has to be eternal and and it can't be have that limited shelf life ever knew it, it has to be. So it has to be infinite. And so we want to, an, ever, an eternal happiness, we want an infinite happiness, we want to always be conscious of it. Well, what meets that criteria, infinite and eternal? Nothing in this world meets that criteria. Mm-hmm. Only one thing meets that criteria, God, universal consciousness, spirit. And so we're all seeking God. And the atheist may say, well, I, I don't believe in God, but yeah, that all makes sense. So that's that first uh, talk he gave. And that is the strength of yoga. It is the science of religion because even sitting in the stillness is a religious concept that's been around for centuries. But if you've ever tried to sit in the stillness, you can still the body, but the mind's racing off in dozens of different directions. It's uh, almost impossible to corral the mind. That's the strength of yoga. Scientifically, step by step, we gain control. And then with that concentration, we attain states of interiorization, and then we attain that state of transcendental experience. We transcend limited, as powerful as it is, we transcend the mind, we transcend thought, we transcend human identification to the level of intuitive perception of that divine spark within us. And ultimately, we see that divine spark in all others, in Mm -hmm. all conditions. And that's so important because 
One reason he was sent at this time, well, it's the, it's the very beginning of this awakening Dwapara Yuga. And the Dwapara Yuga is uh, characterized by uh, sci incredible scientific um, progress and developments. But the spiritual developments do not keep pace with that. And that leads to problems, as we've seen, uh, the atomic bomb, wars, and so forth. And so AI these we all days. Want, yeah, all this stuff. And so we want world peace. And um, there's so many good things, you know, discussions like this, the United Nations mm -hmm. and countries getting together. But what's really going to be the foundation of anything resembling world peace is that spiritual consciousness where I can see the divine spark in you. And even if you punch me in the nose, I'm going to still love you because that isn't you. That body's not you. And that fist hitting me in the nose isn't you. You are that divine spark. <clears throat> Maybe you're not aware of it now, but it is <clears throat> seeing that divine spark is going to be the foundation of anything resembling true world peace and unity and harmony. Yeah. And there's, I, I really appreciate what, what you're talking about. And it's interesting for myself. Of, I've been on a yogic path for almost 20 years, but a, but a different one than the two of you. Um, I've studied much more in the tantric um, philosophies. But what you're saying at its core are really the same teachings that, that I've been taught through through other teachers. Um, Panit G from the Himalayan Institute, for example. And it's, it's so interesting. I remember one of my teachers told me this maybe a decade ago. They said, you know, once you've been practicing for about 10 years, that's when you'll really start to see some of these like undercurrents or these like invisible winds or invisible kind of powers start to show up in your life. And I remember thinking like, okay, that's, that's cool that I would like to get there, you know, and, um, and something I've started to notice lately is the things you're talking about, this sense of inner joy and inner peace and this ever present kind of um, equanimity, even when life is really challenging. You know, maybe you're at a funeral and you're, you're, you're really sad, but you can still feel this sense of joy and appreciation or something's challenging. And you can still touch this space of this is all perfect. And I've started to experience that more and more and more. Uh, but what I've struggled with now is how do I express that and teach that to someone else or put that into words? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, is, I'm wondering if you have some insights into from the teachings of Parahamsa Yogananda is great. We can understand that these things exist. It's different when we've touched them, but let's say for someone who's listening, they're going, that sounds great guys, but how do I do that? How do I bring in that ever present joy? Yeah. And <clears throat> there it kind of goes back to good old fashioned hard work mm. in that nobody can give it to you. You have to work for it yourself. Nobody can give you the desire for God that, and you have to cultivate that yourself and that <clears throat> inner peace and calmness. Uh, you have to work to achieve that. And there's no other way. Nobody can give it. To, Jesus Christ couldn't, Buddha couldn't give it to you. Krishna can't give it to you. You have to uh, make the effort. And so uh, Paramahansa Yogananda taught, hey, uh, when you're in the searching phase, you're interested in this, search high and low. And sooner or later, you will find a path that, that is your path, that is the right one for you. And then you get your full on into that. You live a balanced life, but you're, that's your path. And um, so that that's really important. But growing up in the West, I grew up in a religion basically where it's taught, well, if you don't believe what we believe, you know, you're, it's going to get a little hot for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. That there's only one way to God. It's our path. But that's not true. And that's what, you know, the strength of the teachings from the East is Paramahansa, Yuga, used, Paramahansa Yogananda used the analogy of a mountaintop. And you want to climb that to that mountaintop. And the mountaintop is the fulfillment of the purpose of life, the highest purpose, and that is uh, realization, self-realization, soul realization, God realization, whatever you want to call it. But realizing your oneness, as the scriptures tell us, that we are made in the image of God. That's who we truly are, not this body, not this mind. And so... But just like in a physical mountain, there's many routes to the top of that man, mountain. There's many trails, many paths. Some are quick and steep. Some are long and circuitous. But they all lead to the top of that mountain. And it doesn't matter that we're not all in the same path. There's many paths and for many people. But what is critical, what is important, is that we're all on a path. And that's because, as we said earlier, 
we ha have a body, we have a mind, but we are the soul. And the soul cannot, it can enjoy material things, physical things, but again, they are uh, fleeting. They have a limited mm -hmm. shelf life. It's not going to make us happy in the end. That happiness we seek is found only one place in that reestablishing conscious oneness with God. And that's achieved. It, it, you know, prayer helps, devotion helps, selfless service helps. All these things help. But the quickest and most powerful way to that goal of life, highest purpose, highest goal of life is meditation. So I would encourage anybody uh, to practice some form of meditation. Mm -hmm. And that can be. That can be so many different ways too. I mean, really infinite paths to God realization, I believe is what you're, you're getting at. And I love what you said before around if we turn inside and we work on ourselves, we show up better in the world for ourselves, for our partners, um, as managers, as friends, as leaders. And it's like, it feels like that ripple effect of what, of what you're really teaching through, through the self. Go ahead, Nathan, sorry to cut you off. No, you're good. Um, well, one of the questions that's coming up for me is a lot of times uh, folks really associate when we say meditation to sitting down, silence, calm, no activity. And, you know, the, the um, and I know Yogananda, you know, he, um, the guru, he talks a lot about this restless mind. You know, a lot of us out here are there's just so much active. We're so activity bound that sometimes even the thought of uh, s slowing down, let alone sitting in silence, you know, it can be, uh, it it's frightening to a lot mm -hmm. of folks. Uh, for myself, it took me some time. You know, it was many five-minute meditations that eventually I was like, oh, yeah, wow, there's something here. I'm starting to enjoy this. And it took some time, you know, probably took years to where now, I can be in deep, long meditations and really enjoy it. And I'm curious, brother, if there's a, you know, I'm sure you come across folks that are really wanting to be on the path, but they st struggle with this sense of restlessness and how to calm themselves. Uh, I'm curious if there's any um, nuggets of advice or um, practices you share with them to, to help folks get started and really be able to come over that hump of this frightening image of, oh my God, how am I going to sit still? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I tried to meditate, I was in New Zealand and I sat and I thought, okay, that was probably half hour. I got to go to university, got to go to school. It was five minutes. <laughs> so that's the first thing I would say. And you touched upon it is it's just like dieting, you know, a, mm. a, a fanatical um, diet. Um, you can lose weight, but you're going to gain it right back. It's easy to be, uh, fanatical, it's hard to be balanced and be balanced. So start with five minute meditations. Mm -hmm. And when you can, then you build it up to 10 minute meditation. Don't, don't dive in and try to meditate for two hours. Your body's going to give you all kinds of trouble and <laughs> your, your mind's going to be restless the whole time. So it is baby steps. And so start with five minutes. And, but it is that regularity, which is really important. You know, don't meditate. If you, it's, if you really want to start changing, as Nick was talking about, it's a daily meditation, a twice mm -hmm. daily, morning and evening, morning and evening. And if, you know, it could be five minutes and then 10 minutes in the evening, five minutes in the morning, 10, and then, you know, you build up. Now it's 10 minutes and, and 20 and so forth. And, uh, and it can change through the years. You have a, a baby or something in your family. Well, you know, a 30 minute meditation is a luxury that's probably in the uh, rearview mirror. So then uh, some shorter meditations are, are important, more uh, frequent, shorter meditations. But um, be balanced, be reasonable. And, um, and also, uh, kind of Nick touched on a really important point is, you know, he said, you know, it was really 10 years that, okay, now I'm really starting to see the fruits of my actions. Mm -hmm. And we can't, uh, we're not going to see them day to day necessarily. Sometimes, you know, every, every, you can't reduce God to a rule. And so everybody's different. But uh, as a rule, you're not going to see the changes that are taking place, but uh, they are happening. But it's really, okay, you, you look back over the past year and you realize, oh, yeah, I, I am more calm. My temper is mm -hmm. much more under control and so on and so forth. So don't um, be judging yourself harshly. 
uh, every day because um, we'll get discouraged and discouragement. I don't even think it's arguably the biggest um, obstacle on the spiritual path because uh, just like there are um, uh, spiritual beings, uh, spiritual consciousness that's helping us. Yeah, but uh, we've heard in, in the West, the word Satan is used in, in India, the word Maya is used. It is a conscious co cosmic force. It's working against us. So it's not easy. And so mm -hmm. that's why we have to cultivate that desire to God to keep moving forward toward that goal of ever existing, ever conscious, ever yeah. new joy. It's there. And it's not a matter of if we're going to ever attain it. It's a matter of when. There's no other place to go. We could spend a lot of time down on this plane, so to speak, but ultimately we're going to make it. And so it's, it's just a matter of uh, you know, when, and that's determined by the amount of effort we put into it, daily meditations, um, uh, again. And then when we're in activity, you could be uh, in an in internal conversation with God or an affirmation or mental chanting. It, don't let your mind go off in uh, you know, worldly directions when it doesn't have to. So practicing the presence of God is often a common term um, so that it's the string that ties our meditations together. So when we sit to meditate again, we, we haven't lost that much ground despite being active all day. Mm -hmm. These things are, are really important. I, I love that you're, you're touching on the, um, the path of yoga or realization is not an easy path. It actually can be quite the hard path, which social media may have us believe something differently. I'm just laughing. I'm remembering it, it took me 10 years of Hatha yoga practice to be able to sit and meditate. And then same thing. I used to have to set an alarm for five minutes. And at one minute or two minutes, I would open my eyes and be like, it's been 30 minutes. Like, there's no way it's been, two, you know, nope, two minutes. And so I had to train myself almost like in a Pavlovian way. Uh, with a bell and so okay and i would just say i'm not going to open my eyes until this thing goes off no matter no matter what and the thoughts and the pulls and you're right the forces and the um discomfort like like exercise and then you go five minutes you go, oh that wasn't too bad and then you go 10 and then 20 and then you know like you guys are saying you can sit for a long period of time um but it is not necessarily the easy path i think, I think it can be it can become that uh but initially it can be quite the hard path yeah there's no question it Sometimes it, it is. Um, it's just like anything. Uh, you play a sport, say basketball. Sometimes you can't miss a shot. Some days you can't make a shot. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing on the spiritual path. Some days you sit and meditation is the easiest thing in the world. Sometimes you sit and it's like you've never meditated before. And, and that's okay. Something I state all the time, because this is truth, is effort is progress. Don't don't judge your progress by what you see or don't see in meditation, by what you hear or don't hear in meditation, or by what you hear others are experiencing in mm -hmm. meditation. If, if you're sincerely making the effort, and even if you're struggling, but you, you stay at it. Because perseverance, Paramahantaji said, perseverance is the whole magic to spiritual success. Mm -hmm. And so it's just mm -hmm. about putting one foot in front of the other and leaving the rest to universal spirit, yeah. God. I've That's also great. noticed for myself, you know, just like the days when it's hard, when the motivation is low. And actually, I was experiencing a period of that this whole last week. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it at least once. You know, if I can't do my usual length, I'm going to do at least half of that. So, but not saying, you know, not letting the ball drop completely. Uh, the sense, the consistency and the, and the perseverance. Um, and things like uh, fasting. Uh, where, where I've noticed, you know, the, the body can catch this sense of lethargy, depending on what our eating habits have been like and so forth. There's this a sense of inertia that can build into the body. And I know, I remember, you know, yoga, Paramahansa Yogananda was a big proponent of, you know, maybe having a day a week, ideally, but if not, at least every so often, maybe it's once a month where you go on some sort of a partial fast where the body has a chance to cleanse itself and you can regain energy, which further strengthens our resolve. And there was a lot of these sort of how to live teachings. This was some of the more on the physical aspects, including actually the, you know, the very beginning meditation you led us through where you had us flex our body. So at the physical level, we're flexing, we're tensing muscles, releasing that tension, which has been incredibly helpful. And me being, I remember in the beginning, being able to calm and actually relax because 
a lot of the stuff built in at the physical level is really holds you back, which points to this whole aspect of Maya, which you mentioned that we are up against a force. We're born into this physical world and there's a lot of attachments. Um, can you speak a little bit more to, to really uh, help folks understand what is this force that we're working against and you know, how Paramahansa Yogananda helped with the how to live teachings really help people overcome those. Yeah, that's, it kind of relates to a, the, a question we hear all the time. You've heard, why does God permit suffering? Why yeah. does God permit war? What? And there's no one answer to that. It would take, it takes a series of answers and then you start to, okay, now I get it. But still, you'd probably go, but, but why? But why? You could always go back but to what? But why? And that's why, that's where, you know, faith comes in until we have that realization. Because um, as Buddha was once asked, but uh, the, Christ was too. Christ was asked by Pontius Pilate, what is truth? And he didn't say a word. And that uh, same thing, I think, I'm pretty sure it was Buddha, same thing happened. Somebody asked him, what is truth? He knew they weren't going to understand and there is no one answer and he didn't answer either hmm. and so um as to why there there are it would be another podcast but that'd be a good podcast as to why because there are a number of answers that lead up you know one is for example we we can't know joy and less we know sorrow we can't know love and less we know hate and, you know but you could still say why but we could give a number of answers like that and then it begins to make sense but this is where faith comes in until we have the realization and it has to be basically unconditional faith be, but you know universal consciousness wants us to get this message okay this is needed this experience down here or spiritual beings having a human experience and it's needed and so our, the saints have told us that the prophets the avatars have told us that but she wants us to get this message. And so we hear it again and again through our peers who have had near death experiences. And, um, you know, these people, now there's people, there's millions have had near death experiences. So it's not a small sample size. And, you know, some have very comprehensive experiences and some have very limited experiences, but they all, not, nobody gets there and is dissatisfied with why earthly life, why suffering. One lady, she and and these are people. I mean, if it's millions of people, uh, the majority of those are not um, not necessarily religious or spiritual. But again, freed from the powerful delusion this body overlays temporarily, they get that glimpse of the other side. And the, like this one lady, she when she shared her experience of that near death experience, she said, "I was sobbing at seeing the perfection of it all." Mm. And it is there that we will be satisfied with once we get over there. Once we have that realization, we can have that that answer here through we go in deep into meditation and uh, we can have that answer. But um, until then, it does help that one of our peers got by, saw behind the screen, saw behind the curtain. And she says, I was sobbing at seeing the perfection of it all. Mm. And uh, you see that again and again. There's a fellow even from the uh, Bay Area, Mellon Thomas Benedict, and he had this very comprehensive near-death experience. And his was so compelling because he uh, was an atheist, a staunch atheist. And he wasn't even, he said, I thought everybody in the world was messed up, everybody but me. <laughs> he had that kind of attitude. And then he had a near-death experience. And then he, he said, I... I went to the other side with, you know, great fears about overpopulation and nuclear threat and so uh, deforestation of the rainforest. He said, I came back loving every single problem. He said, I love the mushroom cloud because he saw in that experience how take that atomic bomb, how that brought the world together more than anything up to that point, even mm -hmm. more than religion. Religion has been very divisive in the Kali Yuga. It, it, but at that point in time, the world said to itself, whoa, we got to learn to get along. And there was a real emphasis. That's when the United Nations was formed and something. And now mm -hmm. we've kind of got lax again. But there is a purpose, a divine purpose to it all. Um, there is a force, but we have all the power we need within. And now the tools are being given to us. Uh, you know, we've always had tools, prayer, 
devotion, selfless service, positive thinking, now all these things. But now we've got meditation and practicing a presence. Um, again, that mental chanting, those affirmations are, are greatly underutilized because all of us during the day, all of a sudden we'll start getting us anxiety, an anxious or worried or fearful or angry or hateful. When we feel that coming on, just start re repeating mentally, silently. Nobody has to know an affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that is light. And the light and the mm -hmm. darkness of that anger or that anxiety cannot sh both exist. And eventually the light triumphs. And that's how we get our calmness back. We get, our, we get centered again. And we have as many arrows in our quiver, and we should make use of all those arrows. It's not just meditation. Uh, the the self-realization path in its simplest form, you could say, is a devotional meditation plus right activity. But during that right activity, um, we've got to use uh, affirmations, positive thinking, mental chanting, that inner dialogue with God, practicing the presence. You know, there's mantra yoga, there's japa yoga. Use all these things because we're up against a formidable foe, but we have the power within to overcome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. I mean, the, it, it is this, uh, the deep sense of, uh, yeah, that, you know, there is a force we're against that there's this inner inertia and outer circumstances that we're up against. Sorry, I cut you off, Nick. No, it's just, just really, really landing, um, for me, what you're, what you're speaking of. And I think it's so applicable to, to us living in the Bay area and, you know, things are challenging and I've had three to five moments now of touching this kind of universal oneness through either through meditation or sitting with my master or, you know, being with my wife. And it's been these, these moments of, Oh, I've touched it. And then I get to some, and then when things get tough, I can close my eyes and sense it and feel it and know that it's all, it's all perfect. And that's, it's, I can say it so flippantly now through the experience. And what I love you're, you're talking about here is that, yes, we can understand these things. We can read, you know, we can read autobiography of Yogi and we can understand this and we can, we can even go through and question some of the events. I know I've done that when I've read it and, you know, is this real? But then when we have experiential knowledge through hard work and, you know, uh, perseverance and being conti and continuing to be committed, we really get to see these fruits of our labor, um, even though it is challenging. So one question I'd like to ask, I was thinking this as I've read through the, the book before, do you think all the stories in there are true? Uh, or some of them, um, you know, fables or, or, or stories to help us grow or a combination of the both. Cause there's, yeah. I've sat with a master and I've seen crazy stuff like this before, but you know, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, before I forget, cause you talked about, you had, you know, those experiences, you were blessed yeah. with an experience. And I often, um, encourage people, devotees to, to write those down. The mind's mm -hmm. a fickle friend. And at some point you're going to go through hard times again. And it'd be good if you could pull that out, read it, and put yourself back in that vibration. So I, I would really encourage that. Mm -hmm. Any uh, touching experience, it doesn't have to be phenomenal. It's just, you know, this peace you felt, the joy you felt in observing a blossom, whatever it is. But uh, write that down. Um, That's but, so true. The yeah, mind I do think, is so fickle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, yeah, the mind's a fickle. Like very mind. easy to forget what occurred. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right in the frontispiece of Autobiography of Yogi, he quotes, it's the Old Testament, I believe, that if you uh, see not see not signs and wonders, you will not believe. And so, yeah, those things sound very fantastic to us, but um, to a master, um, any kind of miracle, Christ uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, it's like, you know, it's crazy. To them, it's like brushing their teeth. They know how to operate the laws. They see them very clearly. So uh, all those things in autobiography of a yogi, yeah, uh, to the masters, it, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's, um, but one important thing you touched on is um, that's the power of yoga. And it's why we meditate. Meditation, yoga is not a philosophy we talk about. It is a science that we practice, science that we apply that leads to, a med ex leads to an experience leads to ultimately a transcendental experience. And that's what's so beautiful because I, you know, I grew up in, in a religious belief, but, and we were told love God, but that was it. And um, Paramahansa Yogananda pointed out, you can't love somebody you don't know. 
And through meditation particularly, we can know God. We can get make that contact, mm. and there's no end to God. So it's that's why that it'll never grow stale. God is infinite. But um, I just love that. It, it's, it's practical. It gives us tools to work with instead of just... Uh, in the in the in the in the Bible in the, in the Psalms, it says one of the Psalms says, "Be still and know that I am God." Not be still and believe that I am God, or be still and have faith that I am God, or be still because you have a nice intellectual understanding <laughs> that mm-hmm. God exists. But be still and know. Get that experience, and it's right there. Uh, if we make the effort. We're going to be successful. We're going to get that experience. And that stands up to anything. Like we're wondering if all the experiences shared from autobiography are real. And once we get that experience, we'll know, oh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And we'll know through direct perception of truth that everyone is, is real and uh, more than that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I appreciate, I appreciate that. It's not like you said that through the masters, it's like, I'm getting lunch. I'm just yes. get a cup of coffee. Food. What's, what's your issue? What's like, what, <laughs> what aren't you picking up here? Yeah. I mean, I mean the one that bewilders my mind still, you know, and um, the, luckily I guess you could say I haven't questioned anything in the book. Um, but the one that often bewilders my mind is there would talk about how um, Larry Mahashaya, who was the, uh, the guru of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's guru. So there's, you know, there's a lineage of gurus wow. um, that we're referring to, and how uh, often it would it was quoted. And there's not much written about him. In fact, I continue to sometimes try to find more to read about uh, Larry Mahashaya, but how he could be present in two places at one time. Yes, and he had devotees who devotees who. Uh, he was visiting different folks in in different places at the same time. Right. And they would speak to, wait, the master was with you? Well, he was also with me over here. And like we did this very physical thing. It wasn't like he met them in meditation and somehow it was a hallucination. But they did something in the real physical world. And it's not just Lahiri. You know, as I keep reading about many different saints, Neem Karoli Baba, you know, uh, and many others, similar through lines. And I'm just like, wow, okay, like, they can't just be making it all up. <laughs> and these gurus have such a, uh, I'm curious, you know, brother, to hear a little bit from you, you know, if, if there's a, 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 if there's a way you talk about the understanding of the master's understanding of the laws of the universe. So there's the, there's the things yeah. we're talking about on that we're working through our, our meditative path and connection with God. Um, does that understanding of the universal laws come automatically? Does one have to do something specific? Just I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that because there are these tales that are so out there that are so inconceivable of being in two places mm-hmm. at the same time. Yeah, they come when we attain the proper state of realization, because if they came earlier, then we could use those powers for (laughs) um, less than stellar purposes. Mm. And so, yes, they do come. And it's again, it is as natural to them. They see that as clear. They're seeing behind the scenes. We're just seeing the physical realm. But right behind it is the astral realm. And they they see not only in the Bible, at one point it says, um, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Mm. you know, what does that mean? Well, when you meditate and awaken the intuition, then we will see the body for what it is, divine light. But behind that divine light is the Om vibration. Again, Genesis says, in in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's that word? Om vibration, the Amen vibration, whatever. It's called different names in different religions. But that's the building block of all creation. And that's what a realized soul sees. And they see how that makes prana. And that's how Mm -hmm. Jesus resurrected Lazarus. 
you can you can give a cadaver. There's four things that a physical body needs. It's it's food, uh, liquid, sunshine, uh, and I'm um, forgetting the fourth offhand. But um, you can give a cadaver all those things. It's not going to resurrect that that cadaver. Jesus reintroduced prana, life energy, mm-hmm. and it's easy. Again, it's as easy for them as uh, brushing their teeth. So. Um, Fortunately, what you're talking about, yes, those things do come automatically with uh, levels of realization, uh, but they don't come. It's a good thing they don't come early. <laughs> yeah, and and from yeah, what I freak, uh, freak you out. <laughs> yeah, and there's some, um, there are some practices where I remember one where okay, if you practice this, you will learn to uh, levitate, and that that's real, but. You know, frogs can jump, as it's pointed out in autobiography. Birds can fly through the air. Frogs right. can jump. You know, that's not the goal. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, the, tr- um, the tricks is not the goal. Actually, and and the thing that I, as I, uh, you know, and you see the purpose of the masters of when they do use those powers, what it's for. And they often speak to how, because they have that level of realization and connection with the divine purpose, the divine, uh, you know, himself, that often what they're doing and why they're doing those certain actions is to express that divine will on earth, uh, that there's a certain action that's being asked of them to be completed. And so not everyone necessarily gets to witness that and gets to, some get to witness it. Some hear about it. Like we have, you know, through the books, um, and that there's different levels of experience. Yeah. Yeah. They only perform a miracle when it's the will of God. And some, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's even mentioned in autobiography, it talks about so many different saints, and some live such simple, uh, unspectacular lives. They don't have a world mission. A Jesus and a Paramahansa Yogananda and a Krishna and Buddha, they had world missions. But some are very obscure, and some won't manifest any uh, powers. It's just not needed. Uh, Just their devotion is the uh, example, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, Powers are no indication of realization necessarily mm-hmm. and quite frankly what happens if, if we get them early the ego gets involved pride be, pride swells up and that's led to the fall of many a great yogi many mm-hmm. a great saint yeah. yeah i love when when you learn about the cities which are the i think it's the 50 maybe 52 yogic powers uh, I feel like at the end of the book, they should be like, and by the way, don't don't try to do this because if you get attached to it, then you've missed the whole point of this stuff in general, you know, because uh, yeah, yeah. then what happens when you can't levitate or you can't, you know, um, you can't hear people's thoughts, then it's like, oh, now am I being a bad yogi? Am, have I lost <laughs> my worth? Am I not proving myself? Then the ego can get in this whole game. So yeah, it's, to, it's they let them come, but don't be attached to, to what does <laughs> or what doesn't. Yeah. And don't put a timetable on it. Yeah. Leave that to God. Yeah. I, yeah, like it, it, I like that. Leave, leave that to God. That's great. Yeah, it brings this really important point of like you know our intention of the practice itself. You know, is is it to connect with the inner peace and joy and and the real the deepening realization of how to be in the physical world but not suffer at the hands of it, or is it to attain these higher powers which can then become another egoic exercise that takes us down a different path and which might be what we need to learn. Uh, right, are are to to grow beyond that ego attachment, which is so present and so strong. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a beautiful talk. Um, it's in Only Love or Finding the Joy Within by uh, one of our late presidents, Sri Dayamada, where she says uh, she prayed to God not to send her experiences because they could mm-hmm. become an obstacle to the real goal of love for God. And, you know, her goal was just to love God unconditionally. And, uh, you know, this these powers or experiences could be uh, an obstacle to that. The ego can get involved. It can and she could end up uh, off course. And I, I love that, uh, that she prayed to God not to send her those because they were they could be an obstacle to her real goal. Love for God. Mm. And uh, Paramahansa Yogananda talks about that um, Divine Mother doesn't reveal herself to us fully until she's convinced our love is unconditional. And there's only one way to prove our love's unconditional is that we make the effort with no seeming response. And the key word is seeming. The response is always there. It's like I said earlier, effort is progress. The progress is being made, but 
many of us, uh, Brother Nandamoy was one of our monks, and he once said that, you know, a, a vast majority of us in this low age are in that stage, proving our love's unconditional to God, and that we'll have our reward, you know, on the other side, on our on our deathbed on the other side. Because uh, that that is really, how else can you prove your love's unconditional? Then you keep meditating every day and serving and sacrificing all these things with no seeming response. Mm -hmm. And so that's what Sri Jayamata saw that and said, okay, don't send me any experiences, powers, you know, I want to go, I want love, unconditional love. I don't want that ever new joy. I want you. I want that oneness with you. I, I love that you brought in that, that piece around love for God. Cause when I've, when I've read this, the book autobiography of Yogi, what one of my big takeaways is as, as a student, as someone who's continually looking for, you know, the teachings or the masters that are going to serve work for me, I've noticed, I don't think I've come across anyone else who had such a love for God as 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 yogananda i it's just clear that from the get-go he was like i love god and that's it and i don't want anything in return and i always got that from reading reading this book um just an infinite love for god that i haven't seen in other teachers out there yeah he he was um the avatars will bring a a predominant quality and that was his he was an mm -hmm. incarnation of love yeah I, that that that's exactly what I felt reading the book. So it's very cool that that is how he was perceived and why he was here. That's totally what came. But it's kind of beautiful. In the autobiography, he talks about his guru, Swami mm -hmm. Sri Yukteswar, and who seemed so um, scientific and objective and maybe, you know, uh, you didn't see the devotional side on the surface. And uh, so if we're of that bent that's okay. We can still find God. It doesn't doesn't matter. Eventually, Paramahansa Ji oh, saw behind the curtain, and he saw his devotional side. But on the surface, he he wasn't this um, effusive or uh, necessarily uh, uh, obviously loving uh, in uh, personality. And but uh, the love was there, so we can be of any personality and still find God. Still make the progress. We don't. It's not all one size doesn't fit all. We're not all going to fit into the same box and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And don't let the teacher's personality get in the way of what they have to teach you. you can, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 That, that's really what's yeah underneath there. Cause yeah, there are teachers come in all sizes and shapes and personalities and uh, there's something to learn from, from each one. And uh, you know, he was the right guru for, for Yogananda at that time. And I remember, you know, this, this moment that stands out for me, you know, here we're talking about one of the greatest gurus uh, to bring yoga over to the West, you know, up in, in the last century. And yet he too was disciplined by his guru, you know, Yogananda being yeah. disciplined by Sri Yukteswar. When he was meditating once, I remember reading the story in the autobiography of Yogi and uh, his guru saying, Yogananda, are you meditating? And he's like, yeah, uh, uh, you know, he didn't answer at first. I think there's a couple of different times. And then the guru asked the third time and he, Yogananda responds uh, with like, yeah, I'm meditating. Get, you know, can't you see I'm over here? And there's like, he's like, I know how you're meditating. Your mind is all over the place. And there's this sense of discipline that even the guru needed to strengthen his own meditation practice. Uh, no, it's a great point um, because the, the avatars, the prophets, they come and they struggle. Otherwise, they're not uh, an example to us. Hmm. They have freed themselves in a past life, but they they bring no karma. An avatar, a prophet brings no karma, but they do take on a degree of delusion of maya just so they can stay in a body. And so he had to re-earn, so to speak, that high state of consciousness. And in the meantime, he was, you know, he had intuition, but he also depended on his reason, will, activity, good judgment, discrimination, and common sense, just like we have to do. And then hopefully we mix in as much intuition as we've developed. But, uh, and then we, we reason, will, and act. We make the best decision. At that point in time, it represents the will of God. But we might find in a month, that wasn't the will of God. That was a mistake. <laughs> and then we just have to have enough humility, retrace our footsteps, do it again, try it again. 
And they did the same thing. If you watch the documentary Awake, which was uh, made about 12 years ago on the life of Paramahansa Yogananda, he struggled so much, you know, financially, he almost lost the headquarters three times and people would be treacherous. One time he went on a uh, speaking tour and he gets back. All the furniture has gone from the first floor of the administration building. And they had uh, another property in Washington, D.C., I was believed. And that the person, it was one of his monks who took all that furniture and took it to that other center because that other center, the paperwork was in his name and he, he usurped or took over that center. Uh, but Paramahansa Yogananda always saw the soul. And so he sent that uh, individual a Christmas gift every year. And for about, I don't know, 40 years or 20 years, something like that. And every year it would come back and be returned. But he never uh, gave up trying to reach out and uh, express his love despite that treachery. And uh, yeah, there's uh, stories like that where that's the real saintliness, mm. not the not the miracles. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's so good. Um, well, I think it's time to come, bring it in for a landing, gentlemen, and, and close it out. Is uh, brothers anything you'd like to, to leave us with? Any any thoughts or any techniques or any ways that we can we can live these teachings uh, as we all move forward? Well, I would just say uh, again, as we talked about earlier, with that uh, analogy of the the mountaintop and many roots, it is important. We we have a body, we have a mind, but we are the soul. And so, um, again, Paramahansa Yogananda would ad advocate search high and low for a path that's right for you. And then when you find it, then you're loyal to it. Not that we don't read the lives of other saints and get inspiration from that. But when you find the teacher, Satguru is what it would be called in India. Mm -hmm. And Paramahansa Yogananda is my Satguru. Uh, then you're completely loyal to his teachings while res respecting and having reverence for all other teachers. But if we don't, uh, one of the aims and ideals of Self-Realization Fellowship is uh, uni basically universal uh, development of body, mind, and soul. And most people exercise daily and, and develop the body. And most people like to read or do something to develop the mind. But in the West, especially, um, that spiritual development, that soul development, mm -hmm. it wasn't as advanced as it was in India with practices such as practicing the presence, meditation, and, and so forth. So um, I would encourage everyone to uh, search and find some spiritual uh, practices that they could follow to develop that, even if they don't have, haven't found their path yet. Again, I'll just say that's one of the benefits of the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings. We're non-denominational. And so it'll, it'll make a Christian a better Christian and a Muslim a better Muslim. And if you're brand new, Again, it has these how to live teachings that touch every aspect of our life. How do we spiritualize that? How we can uh, use our everyday activities to evolve and, and propel ourselves toward the goal of realizing ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy within ourselves and then see it within all others. And so don't neglect uh, your spiritual side. Um, find some techniques. And one thing uh, it came to mind as we were talking you know, you talked about the 51 cities powers, mm -hmm. but um, and that's but in chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna delineates the 26 ennobling qualities of the soul that make man godlike and forgiveness is some, one of them and patience is one and charity is one. Those are good things. You know, make a little list and every day strive to uh, incorporate those, develop those through our daily activities. And that's, you know, we we. We do need our activities. Uh, I'll just share a story. Uh, before I joined the ashram, I um, lived on Mount Washington, um, where the international headquarters is, and I served on the garden department of Self-Realization Fellowship there at the international headquarters. And so I was living with four other um, monastic applicants. So it was a little ashram, and you're working four monks with monks, that's harmonious. And you're working with these applicants and that's harmonious. And we would go to the temple for meditations. And so I was, it was a very calm and peaceful, fulfilling life. And I thought, well, I've really, I've really overcome my temper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I joined the ashram. Then I was accepted one day and, and daily exercise a big part of the balanced life in the ashram. And so uh, that day we played basketball 
And we're playing basketball. You're running up and down the court. You don't realize your emotions are getting going. And somebody called a foul on me. And I said, that's not a foul. <laughs> and I lost my temper. I went back to my room. I said, oh, my goodness, it's a, the second day I'm here. They're going to tell me to leave. <laughs> you know. But uh, no, we need that. Because one of the monks was once running around, jogging around the compound in Encinitas. And he saw our house brother. The, the monk was in charge of training the new monks, the postulants. And the brother asked him, he said, you know, why aren't you on the basketball court with all the boys? He says, oh, brother, every day I lose my temper and I'm just going to jog. You know? And it, the monk's response was, you get back on that court right away. Mm -hmm. He was escaping, not overcoming. We need these things. We need this experience. We need the reversals of fortune to manifest, to cultivate that even mindedness, that faith and so forth. So, um, as we said, there's many, uh, we have many arrows in our quiver. And so looking consciously, deliberately for ways to develop those 26 ennobling qualities of the soul during activity. Uh, again, it just spiritualizes our life between meditations and that it's just going to bring so much fulfillment to your life. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, yeah. for leaving us with that. That's uh, profound, and it's a good reminder of the the struggles and the day to day uh, activities that we're part of. That they're they're part of the journey. You know, we, we yes. often talk about on on our podcast here, yoga on the mat and off the mat, and so both are very important and and yeah. fuel each other. Um, thank you so much, brother. It was such a pleasure having you, um, and to really dive in deep here and uh, and and bring the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, the path, uh, but also more widely uh, look at the aspects of the age that we're in, how things are evolving, what role does meditation and uh, the science of yoga play into that. Uh, and really, I love that you encourage folks to to get in touch with that desire for something higher and, and that deeper peace and presence and happiness within them find the path that speaks to them. You know, this might be one or, or another one, but find the one that speaks to them and then commit and, and get on the, get on the journey. Uh, yes. It's, it's one way for sure. I am, you know, as, as we speak about our mission is how we help elevate the consciousness of the planet, which is why we started this podcast. And so feel like we, mm -hmm. we really touched some core aspects of that journey today. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And I was going to thank you both for, uh, this podcast, because it, I, in, even if it only reached two people, it has a vibration, and that vibration mm -hmm. is helping to uplift the uh, mankind. And Paramahansa Yogananda once said, "You can look at the news and think, well, my prayers, my efforts aren't amounting to much. The, the world's a mess." And he said, "You don't know how much worse the world would be if it wasn't for devoted men and women, tens of thousands, mm -hmm. probably you know millions now around the world, you know, meditating, practicing the presence, praying." And so this podcast contributes to that upliftment of mankind. And so thank you for having me and thank you for your yeah. service in offering this podcast. Yeah. yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much for that. All right, team. Thank, and for everyone listening, if this resonated with you, if you enjoyed it, share the episode, share the message. This is how we help elevate the, the consciousness of the planet one, one conversation at a time. And we will never even know the ripples uh, that this conversation can have on others. So please share it if you found it, found it helpful and we'll see everyone next time. Okay. Thanks guys. So long. Jai Guru.